perhaps the Silk Road and pilgrimage can be our jumping off mm. point in terms of uh, of a subject. Is that is that okay with, with you guys? Very happy to talk about that. Very happy to talk about that. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. So I'll I was thinking begin. of like oh, the oh, the oh, inner yeah. Silk Road. Sorry, one more one more yeah. little little. Oh, sure. Uh, the inner Silk Road in terms of the journeys we all take with with books and and etc and then and then the act you're actually going on a journey so you know yeah and and a real pilgrimage so so i like to hear you talk about that yeah so um well maybe i'll talk about that that pivot from the religion that's not a religion into uh the pilgrimage or the philosophical silk road and what that means um so one of the reasons for it was you know, in, in the proper sense, not in any kind of manipulative sense, rhetorical, the religion that was not a religion was just pissing everybody off on all sides. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore it was, it was not, it was, the, it was bothering the religious people and it was bothering the non-religious people. Um, and people would sort of grudgingly admit that they got my point, but they still didn't like it. And there was an affective resistance that was just uh, um, not landing. And then also for me, I, Move, have moved more and more away uh, from, I don't know what to call it, the atheistic pole on the religious spectrum, if there is such a thing. Um, and I'm more and more into a much more vibrant and vital non-theism. The sacred is speaking to me. Sorry, that sounds really pretentious. I, I, I'm experiencing it as the sacred speaking to me more. And that uh, the more and more people I'm talking to, and I mean high caliber, high quality people in this whole arena, uh, like when I was talking to Emil Gerkrist and Daniel Schmachtenberger, the advent of the sacred as a response to the meaning crisis is a growing theme. And I have found myself more and more called into service to doing whatever I can to afford the advent of that sacred in as many people as possible. And so a third thing happened. I was in Etna last year oh, uh, with Bishop I Maximus. Yeah, Etna. Yeah. And he said to me, and he's a dear friend, um, tremendous respect for my work, but all, all obviously a profound commitment to Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And uh, I leave it to him and how he manages those those that wonderful friendship and that deep allegiance. It, it seems to work for him. It certainly works for me. So I'm grateful for that. But he said, John, I don't like this religion that's not a religion. I really like the philosophical Silk Road you've been talking about. And I thought, yeah, there's something there. There's something there. And I realized that the advent of the sacred is not exclusive to the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S. It's also inclusive of people who are in the legacy religions and are homed therein. And then I thought, well, I want to do something that affords, that extends the courtyard of, of Dialogos um, so that people can walk uh, between the various homes. Nobody lives on the Silk Road. People move along it. Uh, C.S. Yeah. Lewis has a very similar notion. Paul Vanderkley told me this when he, his book, Mere Christianity, he calls it hallway Christianity. It's the Christianity that lets people move through the various rooms, the denominations that people live in. But nobody lives in the hallway. But man, if you don't have a hallway in your house, you're doomed, you're trapped, you're imprisoned. And so the Silk Road is meant to be that kind of much more global hallway uh, extended courtyard in which people can find a shared uh, philosophical framework language that allows them to travel in case they need to leave where they are and find another home, or travel, they have no home and find one, or travel and then return to their home, like the anthropologist returning from another culture, and recover their home uh, deeply, it's T. S. Eliot seeing it, uh, seeing it, seeing it again for the first time, and it is. It was my. It has been now my understanding that that is a more full-bodied and appropriate response to the advent of the sacred, and I should not be pronouncing on how these legacy religions may or may not comport themselves to the affordance and the participation in this. I will make what I can available to them. And it, of course, up to their agency and their choice 
how they will respond. And this, of course, is also still directed, as everything on my work always is, is towards the nuns. The effect that this has had on me is it became a, it became very prominently um, clear to me that I could not do this as I'd done any of the other courses. This could not be a merely intellectual, philosophical, or even uh, the teaching of practices like in After Socrates, that this had to be something that I shared by undergoing a pilgrimage uh, to various places on the Silk Road and engaging with various of the sages, uh, both sages that will come along uh, for me along the way and various sages that will represent various homes that I will uh, visit and dwell within. Um, and then when I made that decision, it was like a switch was fl flipped deep in my chest, deep in my psyche. I've been on a personal process of, again, I don't want to build too much into this, but I don't have a better word. There's been something like a purification process I've been going through, a preparation process, uh, a deeply personal uh, spiritual transformation to, to make myself uh, proper to the pilgrimage. Um, and so uh, that is what is happening. I'll say just a few more things and I'll let, I'll let Chris speak. And then when I propose this to uh, uh, my wonderful, I don't like to call them my staff, uh, I don't know who, the group at the Verveki Foundation that uh, support my work and carry out the foundation. Um, there was an immense reception to this. Chris was particularly and has been continuously deeply enthusiastic. He, of course, is very concerned with with the, the philosophical and the spiritual, but the opportunity to also bring in the drama, animation, music, the geophilosophy, the aesthetics as a way of carrying the message. We can talk a little bit more about the format, uh, uh, but the way that uh, he and others, especially Chris, though, have taken this up uh, and it has really called to them, has enriched uh, and encouraged me. So that's m my initial response as to what the philosophical silver road is. Can I make one comment before I, I pass it over to, to Chris? Um, yes. I was thinking about, as you were speaking, uh, you know, I'm not a nun. I, I became, a, you know, a, like a, a real Buddhist at, at a certain point in my 20s. And uh, there, in Buddhism, you take refuge. And, it, and when you take refuge, you, you make a vow to be, it's a strange thing. You make a vow to be homeless, which is yes. kind of strange because, you know, in a way, the meaning crisis that you speak of is about kind of finding home. Uh, but on the, in in another sense, there's there's an embrace of of homelessness. So so I'm you know I'm kind of I was thinking about the dialectic between being you know home and 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 homelessness in, in the world. So anyway, Chris, how, what about you? Want to respond and, and tell me a bit about your pilgrimage or or your travels? Well, I can take that up actually what you just said. I kind of, I like that. Um, yeah, there's something to me about religiousness that is implicitly homeless in a sense, implicitly homeless in a sense of culture. But I think the kind of home we mean, um, I'm curious to see what John, what you say about this, John, because I, I sometimes think we have similar ideas about this. And sometimes I think we have different ideas about this, but I think there is a healthy dialectic between them the idea of having religious home. And the thing that I find healthy and compelling about the idea of the Silk Road and the way that John's envisioning it, especially for this series and in general, is that the idea that there is a kind of implicit religious or symbolic grammar that is sort of native to each of us. And that doesn't mean that that's immutable and can't be influenced and changed across time. But there is a kind of a way in which we have a particular disposition and a particular psychic life that commends us to a certain way of being religious, which is a certain way of encountering the sacred. We don't all encounter the sacred in exactly the same way, and we each have a different road that we need to take to get there. And that particular road that is individual to us, 
idiosyncratically, I think is much more the home that I understand the religious life to be, which is to say, it's something fr it's something within us. So the road is and the home. Be, the path is the well. Path. I, I think I, I think so. Yeah, and I and I think in some sense, yeah. There's I, there is. I think that's true. I think the road is the home. There's a way in which there is a way. I mean, the religious motifs and the motifs of the religious journey always involve almost invariably the renunciation of home in the sense of the protective, enculturated sense of home, and the departure from that seems to be essential to that motif, essential to that pattern. And so the homelessness of religion is, I think, something very important. But, I mean, I guess this is a very stoic idea in addition to whatever other kind of idea it is. But the idea of the Silk Road, to me, is that the wandering and the traveling and the encountering different influences and the metabolizing of a lingua philosophica helps to create a space within oneself into which that inward process can pour itself, discover itself, and metabolize itself, right? Sometimes, uh, you know, the, the more I engage with this work, the more I realize that so much of the dawning consciousness of our encounter with the sacred is ultimately a process that happens to us. It occurs to us. We can bring consciousness to bear on it and augment it and make space for it and inquire within it in such a way as to invite it. Mm. Right. So I do believe that consciousness and the training and the honing that comes with the Socratic way and all of the attendant practices have a very, very powerful role in sensitizing us to it in drawing it out and inviting it, right? The whole idea of the dialectic as being the inquiry that makes space for that which is unconscious and upswells into our awareness, as opposed to something that we contrive or, or create from the top down, which incidentally was the overtone to the religion that is not a religion that I think mm -hmm. was the mm -hmm. thing about it that didn't work. It implied design principles. Yeah. It implied a top-down over determination of something that is fundamentally an upswell and can be tutored and honed and trained and finessed and disciplined by Socratic inquiry and necessarily so, but is ultimately something that is endogenous within the person that has to be discovered and that we can bring all kinds of techniques to tutor it, but that we have to let it be what it is. And all of these techniques and journeys and adventures and philosophical language, I think really at its best, serves to make space for a process that happens to us and that we have to simply receive. And there's a humility to that, to me, mm -hmm. that makes it much more authentic as a religious journey and as a religious pilgrimage. And the, um, as John likes to use this word in the positive sense, the humiliation of the project. Yeah. Mm -hmm is I think what makes it trustworthy to me. And so there's the fundamental idea of the Silk Road as being that, as being a journey to discover that native language within that commends us to the character we must become in order to access the self that we are and become that and become unto it and become unto it in a way that we can realize ourselves in relation to the sacred. Maybe not in a way that is identical with any one person, but we find, I think it's much easier for us to find um to accord and find peace in our relations with other people if we find the home within as opposed to the home underneath a canopy grouped with a bunch of people who may have a very different idea of what this is to them first of all i, I want to respond to that andrew and then i'll let you uh, take us further thank you for that chris i think as he frequently does chris articulated the exact point and the exact point was the shift from a very almost imperious, top-down orientation with the religion that's not a religion, an engineering attitude or stance, to one uh, that is properly uh, from the standpoint of you know humility. The attitude, the stance is one of inventio towards the advent of the sacred. I like that, actually. It's a nice turn of phrase, inventio, towards the advent. 
Um, and I think that's that's exactly to the point. And I just want to reinforce that that shift that he is pointing to in the, the you know the orientation, the standpoint, and the stance. I think that is fundamental. He fundamentally articulated what is central and crucial about the shift from the religion that's not a religion to the philosophical Silk Road. As he said, there obviously it takes discipline. Discipline means to follow. And if you're going to walk a road, you better follow a path, right? Uh, you just can't wander aimlessly. But that discipline is always within inventio that is in service of the advent. So first of all, I want to thank Chris for that. I think that was astonishingly articulate and to the point, and I'm grateful for that. Uh, no, I love issue... that too. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah go, no, no, go, go ahead, Andrew. No, I'm just saying I love very much that as as a image which is contrary to the sort of reactionary movement of religion yes. uh, that you feel uh, that people are going back to that because they want the safety of of uh, you know a prescribed ki kind of modality of religion. You know, it could be in the Christian or the Buddhist you know, or any, any religion, whereas this is a very open path in the sense that one could be, you know, a Buddhist or, or a Christian uh, or, or, or whatever. And, um, and, and then, but still visit these other places and cause there is no thing called a, a you know, called a Christian or a Buddhist or like it, it's a, it's every, there's a uniqueness to every particular journey, which, which has a whole, you know, tapestry of different influences. Mm. Yeah. And not only individually, but collectively. I mean, uh, the advent of Christianity transformed Judaism. The advent of Islam transformed Christianity. The, like, yeah. th these religions, they don't remain isolated from each other. There's always this toing and froing and mutual transformation, some of it hostile, some of it uh, friendly. Uh, you know, and... and I want to say to people, I'm under no delusions that the actual Silk Road, which was for commerce and also the creative ideas, there was violence and bloodshed and warfare associated with it. I'm idealizing from that uh, it, it, what it what it created. It created a lingua philosophica, right? It created this pathway uh, where you had sort of Neoplatonism from the West and Zen from the East reaching towards each other, being influenced by Vedanta and other things along the way. Um, now, about the issue about homeless, uh, I agree with Chris, and, and I think the move is from the cynics who thought you had to, uh, you know, is a particular physical home that you had to abandon to the Stoics, as Chris said, and the Socratic sense of being cosmopolitan, that where the cosmos was your polis, that you're at home in the cosmos. And I think the part of that is the recovery of something which is now becoming increasingly more scientifically plausible and increasingly more realizable in practice, which is a recovery, and I mean that in like the Tolkien sense, of the microcosmic, macrocosmic uh, relationship, mutual internalization and indwelling, and that recovery of that profound interpenetration, uh, I think is, the, the, and finding that through line is exactly what we're talking about. It's that sense of home. And I, this has again landed for me very... Um, personally, very recently. Um, uh, I was very honored uh, when Jordan Peterson called me and invited me to participate in his next big series, The, the Gospel Seminar. And as somebody who has a very uh, fraught relationship with Christianity, I don't know if that's the right word, I was mm -hmm. there. And I, and I made it very clear. In fact, Jordan, at one point, I, I was we were doing in, in, in individual interviews, and I was saying how I'm there as a non-theist, a Zen Neoplatonist non-theist, and a skeptic in the ancient sense of deep inquirer and open and wanting to hear. And and the, the the director said, you just made that up right now? Like, that just came out of you? And Jordan said, that's why he's here. Like, they wanted me here for that. And, mm -hmm. they, mm -hmm. and, and they thanked me for it. And so I, 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 want, I want to make very clear that I was well-received and welcomed, and I participated in a way that I think in a virtuous sense, I'm very proud of. But as I was doing this, and I again, I, I, I did that long preamble because I don't want people to misinterpret what I'm saying, right? 
I came to the real I, a great peace, and I, I was I'm reading a lot of books on Jesus. Some of them from Christians, some of them from Zen Buddhists, uh, which has been really wonderful. Um, uh, Sally McFagg's presentation on the parables and her proposal that Jesus is the parable of God. All of this was just resonating with all of this. But a great peace. <laughs> this all this when you when you try to talk this way, you sound like you're in a you know, an old time Disney movie or a Hallmark commercial. Oh, and it's frustrating. Um, a great peace came over me because I realized, and I don't, and I really mean this in a very kind way, my longing to return to Christianity and the envy I had fell away from me. Mm. And I felt deeply, deeply at peace. Uh, and I can't, and it, that uh, the problem I'm struggling with is that sounds very negative. That sounds like I finally was completely orphaned and homeless. And in one sort of technical sense, that's true. But I found that I had come into a more living relationship with Jesus of Nazareth. Um and I am not criticizing the Christianity that was made present to me because I was very impressed by it. And I want everybody to hear that and very respectful of it and appreciative of it. I learned a lot. Genuine dialogos was taking place repeatedly. Um, but I just realized that the Silk Road and what it is coming to mean for me is giving me that peace and yeah. john when you're talking i felt shivers all over me because there's a way in which i find the return to christianity like i'm sympathetic to christianity as well but I, but i in a way i would i have the feeling that it's it's like it's starting a war or something or it's a conflict you know between christianity and islam or between christianity and there there there's there's a lot of really intelligent christians and in, you know out there um, but but they seem to have a wall around them. They don't seem to be open. Um, and I, I don't I'm, I don't want to speak for all Christians or anything like that because yeah. I, I you know I I talk, I I had a good conversation with with Jordan Hall about his his conversion and and yes. I, I I do listen to uh, you know Jordan and 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 the Exodus series and I listen to that stuff. But I have, I have a feeling it's it's us against the 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 world or something that there's a real like. There's a real like uh, uh, lines being strong lines being drawn, which feels somewhat dangerous to me. Does well, that make sense? These, yes, it does, and and that was definitely there, um, not so much on camera but off scene, and and the privilege I had was both off scene and especially on camera. I I made a critique of what is now being called cultural Christianity. And I think cultural Christianity is a great... Richard Dawkins has just came out as a cultural Christian. And of course, it's part of the defense against Islam, the defense of Western civilization against Islam. And Islam is not innocent in any of this. Religions are capable of being yeah. aggressive and adopting a conquest mentality. And there's certainly aspects of Islam like that. But of course, there's been, there is and has been aspects of that in Christianity and everything else. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so... I was able to criticize and critique in the philosophical sense uh, cultural Christianity because I think it is a great disservice to what Jesus of Nazareth was trying to share with people because it instrumentalizes Christianity and therefore go, yeah. fundamentally, fundamentally perverts it from what it is supposed to be and how it is supposed to operate. And so I stand, and I'll say it here publicly, I stand against I stand against cultural Christianity and, and, and for overlapping, because they're not identical, but for similar reasons against Christian nationalism. Both of those are instrumentalizations of Christianity and idolatrous, putting it in service of what their true God really is, which is Western civilization on one hand and the United States of America on the other. And I do not regard either one of those as proper entities for ultimate concern or worship. Yeah. I think that is a profound sin of idolatry. And sorry, you can hear the anger in my voice. And I think it is a great mm -hmm. 
great disservice. And if that is what Christianity is turning towards, and I don't believe it is, but if, if it somehow weirdly turns out that that is what Christianity turns towards, then I will stand against that Christianity because I think it has nothing but an idol. It is nothing but an idolatrous per perversion of the spirit that lived in Jesus of Nazareth. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. I think I fully, I'm fully on board with, with that. Um, that's what I, what you, you articulated what I was feeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any comments, uh, thoughts about this, Chris? I, I, I mean, I agree. John knows I agree. Um, deeply, deeply, deeply. Um, this is not a new problem. It's not a new critique. Uh, it goes back, goes back a fair ways, but it's certainly as present now as it has ever been. The idea that Christianity is something that you, uh, you, uh, you culturally absorb or dispose yourself to as part of a collective that turns towards some practical worldly affair. And I think the idea of instrumentalizing it in service of another good, I think that's a really good way of putting it, putting it in terms of that kind of idolatry, I think is exactly right. And the idea that you can systematize Christianity into a set of values or beliefs about, or, or a, 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 a a fleet of ethical standards that don't have to do with the core orientation of having a relationship with the person or persons um, of the divine, if I can put it that way. The idea that you can be a Christian without actually trying to cultivate a mysterious relationship with, you know, Jesus it's interesting, Nazareth, like this Jesus triumphalist, Christ. triumphalist mode of Christianity is the opposite of, of Christianity. It's like, it's like what yeah. it's like the Antichrist or something, right? Well, well that's interesting. I mean, that makes me think of it kind of makes me think of Jung a little bit, right? One of Jung's sort of yeah. great comments was that one of the things that Christianity never fully did never evolved into was a proper integration of the Antichrist that was produced from itself. Mm. And uh, that is uh, yep. a project, yep. I think, in many ways that continues Christianity. Like John said, it's true. I mean, it's not static. It's not immutable. It's not standing still. Nothing does. Nothing does. It continues to work itself through us and evolve and evolve through us and through our understanding of it. Um, and that somehow what we give back to it, what we the way that we understand it and the way that we somehow comport ourselves changes the very thing that we behold. Um, and um, so the stakes are, are always high, but the idea that, that Christianity is a, is a cultural ethic rather than a profoundly, a fundamental, a, 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 re a relationship with being that is made manifest in relationship to Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That is, to me, the essence of what Christianity is, right? And that, of course, is is bound in the virtue of love. But that the idea that there is a Christianity that does not have that as its absolute synosure, as the center of it that binds it all together. And yeah. if we're not talking about that, then what are we talking about? We're not talking about anything, really. We're just talking about some kind of worldly ethic that has used Christianity to to um, execute itself, basically. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy and to hear this like from you guys, because I, I it's this is just not the culture war. And I'm so tired of the culture war. I like I, yeah. I don't want to engage in that at, at all. And and I, I think I think people have to go beyond that on some level and and have this say think like have this kind of conversation i think well, the other thing I, is that the idea oh, that you reason you reason your way into it you know the idea that you can represent it like representations you know representations of christian doctrine representations of a christian ethic are just that right they're they're scaled versions of trying to um they're, they're refractions of something that's nameless, right? I mean, I, I think that to me that, that we have to come back to something ap properly apophatic, I think, when we come back to yep. Christianity. And that central relationship is made 
flesh so that it can be made known and present and embodied and so that it can actually get intelligible traction in our nervous system somehow to me, right? That to me is like the importance of the embodiment of that symbol and that relationship is so important because it makes manifest and present, you know, something that is otherwise, I think in the Neoplatonic tradition, I find a little bit more difficult to access when it is abstracted mm -hmm. into a fleshless mm -hmm. kind of reality. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. There is something about the embodiment of that reality in the prism of the, or in the matrix of the human relationship that is our deepest, deepest, deepest touchstone to what is most real and visceral within us that gives it its power, right? Whether the symbol, whether the Christian symbolic framework is essential is kind of a difficult question to answer, right? Like we're getting into, we're getting into like levels of reality that we don't even have access to. And I really have no interest in accessing because of the sheer unknowability of them but the fact of the matter is what makes what makes the infinite and the mysterious present to us such that we can relate to it deeply in a way that touches us and feels most real in us and such that we can become in its likeness to me that is the power of christianity I'm not arguing for its essentialism mm -hmm. or its supremacy over other traditions to me it's just like a pointless question right it's a question of personal relationship that matters it's not a question of abstracting into metaphysical certitudes that's where i think we often go wrong i'm getting into a rant guys sorry i think that's where we <laughs> often go good. wrong we often go wrong right? we try and abstract ourselves away from what is real in our experience and when we start doing that and we start systematizing things and generalizing them and creating these hierarchies, we we just miss the plot completely because we miss mm. what is most real in our own experience, right? And so someone doesn't find that in Christianity. Fair enough, fair enough. But I think that, you know, those who find a great depth in that, find a depth in the texture of the capacity to relate to that which is so which exceeds our comprehension so thoroughly that we can never hope to grasp it. And that's something about making that present in the very thing that we know so deeply, which is our the reality of our own human relationships, we mm -hmm. somehow gain access to what is inaccessible. And that doesn't scale into the body politic. That doesn't scale into ideological ethics it just doesn't scale that way and if someone wants to make that leap whatever they're doing it's not christianity you know anyway hmm, great yeah i mean Isn't i can that... accept that as a buddhist <laughs> you know totally i mean <laughs> sorry uh, uh, john's gonna speak for a while so just let me say that yeah. it's it's like i really uh it's a fundamental sort of, you know, I, I can translate everything you say into that into Buddhist language, and I don't have a problem, you know, there's no problem. Uh, you know, and I was just speaking to a, a tantric, you know, Vajrayana master who was saying that the mass is the ultimate tantric ritual, you know, it's you're drinking the blood of Christ and the body yeah. of, so, so, so this is, this is, this is so deep, that it, it it's almost it's beyond any, any religious identity, I think. Uh, um, so, man, I love you, my friend. I mean, oh, oh, my gosh, the spirit in you is just so astonishingly beautiful. And I mean that in a, the profound platonic sense of what beauty is. He, you, do you see how he was exemplifying the very thing I was trying to put into words about Christianity being transformed and recovered as it enters into walking the philosophical silk road and then you andrew started walking with him accompanying him yeah. and it's not like you found some logical identity and propositions oh, some yeah. pathetic perennialism between buddhism and christianity you found this through line that allows you to translate without logical identification or reduction so that you can accompany each other i mean that is the philosophical silk road right there it right, happened in it. front of your <laughs> eyes 
cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Now, to the point that Chris made, uh, I think, I mean, so uh, I think Chris also exemplifies his patron philosopher, Kierkegaard, because Kierkegaard's great critique of Christentum at, you know, in mm. favor, in service of Christianity, I think is now cuttingly relevant. And everybody who's thinking about Christianity needs to read Kierkegaard deeply because his critique of Christentum, Christendom, coming from the heart of Christianity, and Chris has internalized this profoundly, I think is relevant, super relevant right now. Now, in in connection with that, for me, and I, I, th I hope also for Chris and, and helped by Jacob Howland, we did within After Socrates, we did the series within the series where Kierkegaard is basically doing an unresolvable, intended so, an infinite game in James Carson's sense between Socrates and Jesus. And he keeps looking like he's going to resolve it, and then he keeps toing, and towing back and toing and froing back and forth. And there's this ongoing reciprocal opening, the tonos, this creative tension between Socrates and Jesus. And 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 you know, and, and where I was sort of taking the role, uh, we're both being pretentious, and so to take it with a grain of salt. I was taking the role of Socrates, and uh, and Chris was sort of speaking through Kierkegaard of Jesus as the Christ, um, cosmic Christ, especially, especially. And for me, part of that, see that that was part of that piece. Because I, 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 there was a stage in the Jesus seminar where I said, you know, I am deeply, I am deeply committed. I'm being as sincere, as honest as I can to a, you know, a committed relationship and participation in the logos. Because they were talking about the logos and Christianity, and they're deeply. And I was talking about all of this in practice, and in, right, and in, in the very allowing it to go into the very warp and woof of my psyche and myself and my personhood. And then, right, but they said, when some of that, well, then why aren't you a Christian? And I said, because I actually respect Christianity. And it makes certain claims that I can't, I can't accept, right? Um, and, 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 and I don't know. I make a distinction, and it's a valuable distinction. I'm not throwing the distinction away between what is psychologically indispensable and what is metaphysically necessary. An easy example is it's it's psychologically indispensable for my cognition, English, right? But that doesn't mean all cognitive agents have to speak English. It's not metaphysically necessary, but it's in it's indispensable for me given my background. I and and there's things about right. I can't tell about my inability to take on Christianity if it's because I found certain things that I don't agree with metaphysically, or or because there's just psychologically indispensable things about me because I had a traumatic relationship with Christianity. And I've stopped trying to find, because I think they bleed into each other. I, I was treating it as if there was this fine line and easy distinction between them, but it's not so easy when you get into the depths of the psyche between what is indispensable to the psyche and what is metaphysically necessary to being a cognitive agent. Because we are, as Chris said, we are persons that take a personal stance. And so I stopped also trying to resolve the dialogos between Jesus and Socrates, and that is where I dwell now. That is where I dwell now. And so I think that is, I think I talk about the symphony of sages. I think the Silk Road is also a way of people getting to live what you and Chris just demonstrated. The Sim you, the Buddha and Jesus, the symphony of sages, the music took hold, and the Buddhist part of it and the Jesus part of it, the Christian part of it, aren't identical, but they fit together. They belong together. We talk about musical accompaniment for a reason, They're, right? There's a symphony there going on. There's a symphony of sages. And I think another way of thinking about the Silk Road is singing the song of the symphony of the sages so that this becomes what, what you both of you just so beautifully exemplified, becomes available to us as an alternative to let's draw up the battle lines and see who's going to win in the zero-sum battle. I rejoice at the piece you're describing, John. This just, just letting go. Just letting go. 
Like mm. we, it's like we spend so much of our time inwardly clenched and in, in a state of perpetual strain when we come up against apparently insoluble questions and feel as though we have to resolve those questions and bring everything into order. And if only we could understand more, if only we could understand more, if only we could understand more in ever finer degrees of resolution, we could somehow force upon ourselves a peace and a coherence. And one of the things I'm hearing from you is that you getting to a point where you realize that some things within are in fact insoluble or some things within are perhaps indecipherable even when subject to the fastidious kind of analysis that only someone like you could bring to them and if at the end of all of that they're still insoluble that there's some mystery beneath them having to do with your relationship that you now have the opportunity to let go and step back and let be what is and it occurs to me that any real resolution and the, the nameless kind of resolution, the, never re the kind of resolution that could never be reduced to a proposition, that could never be adequately explained, but known within in terms unknown, is the kind of resolution that could only be made possible by the act of letting it go, by the act of making peace with the incomprehensibility of certain realities within us and allowing them to be what they are. And perhaps in letting them be, there's a chance that greater understanding comes from relinquishing a certain hold over them. I think that's beautifully well said. The way I've been thinking about this is as I have been shifting the emphasis from propositional contradiction to performative contradiction, right? Um, not that propositional contradiction doesn't matter, but that performative contradiction is w way more important. I've also correspondingly shifted from propositional resolution to performative resolution, which, of course, Kierkegaard does recommend and Socrates does recommend. Um, uh, and there's a way in which you you can't resolve these. And it, it, yeah, the, this is where the Taoist training comes in, the Wu Wei. You know, you the, you can't resolve the tonos of the yin and the yang. If you try to resolve it, you are misunderstanding and misapprehending it. But you can resolve to you can do a performative resolution in which you commit yourself to being responsible to it and faithful to it um, as the thing that is beyond your final conceptualization. And I think that personal resolution, which I think is something what Kierkegaard meant by faith, purity of heart. I think is what really, really matters ultimately um, for bringing about the cultivation of wisdom and virtue. Um, and, and, you know, and along the way, I mean, I've been doing a lot of work about the imaginal and then how it feeds into the imaginal within the rational and the rational within the imaginal. And I think Jesus and Socrates are, are both figures that are properly, uh, and, and the Buddha are properly imaginal um, and that, and that, and that they enliven and vitalize a, 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 a ritual and practice within an ecology of practices in a way in which no proposition ever can, and therefore that personal resolution to follow their way, I think, is actually more important. Um, again, I don't want people to mishear me as some kind of lackadaisical romantic. Resolving propositional contradiction is important. Getting conceptual clarity is important. But in the end, the cultivation of wisdom is not driven by that. It is Those are merely necessary and very far from sufficient conditions. And um, so um, one of the gifts that came out of the, the gospel seminar is Jesus is imaginal for me now. Oh, interesting. I was thinking that when you guys were talking about you know, something a Zen master, I, I, I heard, uh, you know, I, I met once said that, like, the function of religion is is to save people from themselves uh, on some level. And that struck me as true. And then he said, Zen is not a religion, you know, so, so, uh, so, so, so there, there is a way, so there's a way in which I was thinking about what it means to be like saved, right? So there's a way in which there's, 
uh, that Christianity does this dirty trick and says, if you don't, if you don't follow Jesus, you're going, going to go to hell and you won't be saved. And, um, but I always like the idea of universal salvation better. So the people who are in within the religion and the people without are equally saved. You know, it's just a long process of, uh, and they're not saved by, again, by t taking on any kind of dogma or propositional whatever the, the the conversion is a deep conversion of you know a deep transformation which can occur inside or outside the religion you just jesus the verse that is often quoted is misquoted jesus didn't jesus didn't say believe in my doctrine he said i am the way mm -hmm. the truth and the life no one coming to the father but by me well that means christianity he didn't say christianity is the way he said i am the way and who and what is he he is the logos he's the parable of god the resolution to be faithful to the logos which uh, we practice in dialogos dialectic into dialogos that to my mind and i presented that to to the to the seminar I said to my mind that is the way of right living out that verse that jesus was talking about and again, there was a very, you know, welcoming reception to that proposal, um, and and I think I think the disservice, and this is a this is a tricky thing to say, but it goes towards the the Christendom and Christianity distinction. I think the way Christianity has often identified itself with Jesus, as if it is Jesus, is problematic. Um, in some ways, and it leads to a kind of idolatry of Christianity itself. One of the things that gets in the way between Christians and Jesus is Christianity, paradoxically, yeah. really paradoxically. Uh, and I don't say that as some kind of harsh village atheist, right? I'm not the village idiot. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm trying to say this from deep, deep respect and, you know, and understand. I'm trying to say it as much as I can from the inside. Um, and and so I think Christianity needs to rethink what that very provocative verse. One of the things I was, one of the, I got, I I was so one of the reasons I went is because I knew Douglas Headley was going to there. We sort of hit it off in Cambridge, but we didn't have time to gel, and so we got we got quite close. And he said, "There's now very good argument and evidence that's upturning things. It looks like John might be the earliest gospel." Because John is so philosophical and everything, it was always the story that John is very le much later and very far removed from the historical Jesus. But there's all this new uh, scholars, scholastic work saying John might be the closest to the historical Jesus. Of course, John the not, least dogmatic uh, of the. Uh, no, I, well, or, jo but John is the one or, that pre presents Jesus in the most divine light. Divine right? light, and okay. that has tended to be easily assimilate, assimilated to the doctrinal structure. Of, of Christianity. Uh, but, right, what I'm saying is, if that verse is in John, and John is closer, there's something going on there. And is Jesus really proposing um, the, uh, the adherence to a set of propositions when it means to understand that he is the way? I, I don't think so. I think he's what the, the gospel, what the, the letter to the Hebrews says. He is the visible icon of the radiance of God, of the invisible God. And I think that's what it means. And I think uh, to follow him, as John says, is to become exactly like him as much as we possibly can, to become sons and daughters of God. Um, <laughs> see, this is what often happens to me. I end up talking the language of Christianity from somebody who is actually trying to criticize Christianity and perhaps call it back to what it oh. should be in my mind. It's funny. I was talking. I was thinking about Jordan Hall and our conversation. And um, you know, I, I'm very fond of Jordan. I, I I always felt that there was something profoundly like Christian in his spirit before he <laughs> converted. That yeah. that a lot of the times what he was talking about, like was Christianity. What he was looking for was a church, and what he was looking for were these things. And then exactly. he kind of found it in Christianity. But that was already there uh, on some level. Uh, and it's that there's a lot of people who aren't within Christianity who have a sort of a Christian operating system. Uh, that's a, a you know ugly metaphor, but and that and that's the obverse of what I was talking about a few minutes yeah. ago. There are many people I think who are deeply Christian like Jordan without yeah. realizing it and that and for them 
that is what I mean where people who can come home to Christianity via the philosophical Silk Road. Jordan, ha I was just talking to Jordan yesterday. He said, he, you know, he said uh, he he makes a gate. He makes a joke about me, me being like a gateway drug into Christianity for people. Uh, yeah. But like, like I, I was talking to him a, about a, a, a exactly that kind of thing about how you know he has he recovered something that was all as as you I think as you divined within him, right? Oh, nice play on words there. Sorry, uh, mm -hmm. you divined within him that he. Uh, uh, you know, he he was looking for what I think Christianity at its best offers people, and he found it. And a lot of people don't understand why he's at home, but like, just just the way he shows up, like I've all, Jordan's a dear friend, and I love him. And so I say this from that perspective. I said this to him, and I've said this to other people, and they've acknowledged it. Jordan is warmer than he ever was before he became officially a Christian. It gave yeah. him access to a depth of himself and an affective, in the good sense of the word, side of himself that he couldn't get otherwise. He couldn't Maybe that's what it means to be saved, uh, to, to re recover that warmth of, of humanity, um, in a that's sense. A good to, enough to not, to not Because you could live in a very, you know, there's so many philo philosophers out there who are very cold, you know. They're not in the heart. They've, they've developed a huge conceptual you know, uh, structures, which are, are, you know, even, even unbelievably incredible, but, but, but then I, then, then there's, then they don't, they're not in the heart, you know, I think like, I always think of the, th I'm, I'm very fond of uh, the mystic Gurdjieff and he talks about three brains. We have three brains and, uh, you know, um, uh, a lot of people are, you know, the philosophers are really in, in just so mental uh, and I, I find it for but but i think that was the pain that jordan was feeling in many ways because and that it, what he was searching for really is is uh you know the heart <laughs> if i could be so uh but he found the mosaic. language of the philosophical silk road very helpful like yeah. that's what he meant like, like a, 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 a lot of the work i did on neoplatonism and i and he and his reading of james filler's astonishing book you know heidegger neoplatonism uh, and uh, the history of being, right? Um, uh, he found that the, the, the Silk Road helped him recover in in the Tolkien sense, helped him recover Christianity, uh, and um, and it yeah, might help somebody recover uh, Buddhism or, yes. or Sufism yes. or or any other kind of, kind of religion. I think is what you're saying. Well, it it would just well, help we, somebody recover, like the religion we choose is the one we 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 we're most fond of that we like the best right in a way like that but not in a facile way not in like, no not in a facile not way not in a consumerist oh it. that's i like i'll have one of those no no I'll no have one of those it, it's not that it's not that it, no, it's, it's, but, it, but it is the one you fall it's more like falling in love right it's like, exactly you know, that it's is not, the appropriate it, it, metaphor it's, it's not the one you choosing. fall in love with yeah yes yes it is the one you fall in love with exactly Mm -hmm. Cause, cause that's funny. Cause I was in my discussion with Jordan. Also, I was talking about how he thinks through every, everything. Cause he's a philosopher, you know, I'm not, I'm just not a philosopher by nature. I, 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 and, and, and how I became a Buddhist very easy, very early because of falling in love with certain people. It almost had nothing to do with the, the doctrine or it was just the beauty of it. Right. So it was an instantaneous reaction, and so I started sitting in zazen and in temple, and in, 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 you know, in Buddhist temples. Um, and then later, I sort of started to think about what it means, you know. And 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 then I even, you know, I started to think about Christianity and 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 other religions. But for him, he had to sort of think his way through there until there, you know, and then fall into it or something. But he met people. Very interesting. I, I, yeah, I think I think that's a pivotal point. This also came up when the discussions uh, mm -hmm. I was having in Nashville. Nobody is fundamentally, ultimately persuaded to do a metanoia through a set of propositions. Again, mm -hmm. the propositions can be valuable. What changes people is meeting people, that I, 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 yeah. meeting them deeply. Like you said, falling in love with them, not erotically, uh, or at least not in our current sense of erotically, but phileically and agopically, right? You, like it's people that are the portals of metanoia. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and this is why any attempt uh, to understand what happened to Jordan just as an inferential structuring of propositions that lead to a conclusion, I think is a mistake. I think mm -hmm. he went to a place where he found people living 
what he was looking for, and he fell in love with that. It's an entire way of life carried within and between people that really affords metanoia. The, the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, right? Yeah. And Jesus, I am the way. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. Like, this is the profound... And again, when you say it, if you say it just as the words, it sounds like a bloody Hallmark card. But if you can get to a place where that is shocking again and wakes you up, then you're getting it. Then yeah. you're really getting it. No, I, I agree. I wasn't... I didn't mean that in any... Uh, negative no, sense no, I towards I, him. I, Andrew, I, I was thinking about were. his just different styles of people, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, the yeah. fact that some people are are you know uh, you know in the Hindu tradition they talk about karma yoga people who work towards redemption. They, it's the work that yeah, does it. Other yeah. people are are devotional and and uh, you know it, that that's their primary. Um, they're bhakti yogis and and then and then the johnny yogas are the ones and and he's more like a johnny yogi within that yes, system yes. Uh, if that makes any sense i wasn't uh, no, saying that Andrew, he, yeah please don't misunderstand me i wasn't misattributing that to you i wanted to i wanted to foreclose on people who might have heard that in what you were saying i, gotcha. I wasn't attributing that to you at all and i wanted to make clear and i think i, I you know i want to i want to go back to that i knew about that that taxonomy but i i'm thinking uh, this is just, it's something I think the Verveki Foundation should go back and look at again more carefully. These sort of four fundamental orientations that people have towards, right, the recovery or the falling in love uh, with the sacred. Uh, you said I four. I, I mentioned three. What was the, what's the fourth? Um, well, there, I mean, there's the way of work. There's the way of devotion. Um, there's the... Uh, there's the way of sort of mental training. And then there there are people, this isn't in the, sorry, I, I'm blending traditions together and I shouldn't have done that. I apologize, that was a mistake. But then there's also the Zen idea of people who have a spontaneous sort of satori. There are people who it hmm. it, it comes over them. There's no other way of putting it. And, and um, those people... Um, also have to be given a framework that is other than the way of work, the way of devotion, the way of mental training, the way of uh, mental psychological training. That, mm -hmm. that was the four that I was thinking of. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the reason why the fourth one matters, just just because it, just so I don't and I don't seem as just pedant, uselessly pedantic, pathetically pedantic, is forty percent of the population approximately has profound anomalous experiences, mystical experiences, transformative experiences, visionary yeah. experiences. And there's no framework for them. There's no framework. That's part of the meaning crisis. And so they flail in many, many ways. And you know and, and the and the psychedelic Renaissance is just ramping all of that up, right? Yeah. Um, and and people who are who, have that happen to them they need a different kind you can't immediately say well go into work or go into mental cultivation or or go into devotion there's something else uh, a way in which they need to be received into um, a relationship uh, to ultimate reality um, so that's what I meant by the fourth sorry I, I, I was I was I was un, I was in my haste of thought I was sloppy I apologize. <laughs> you're forgiven john but yeah yeah well that, no i thought that was very interesting that fourth i'm still trying to wrap my mind what uh, about what that what that is uh, people maybe people who are or have a mystical nature or mystical experiences or um, there are people that and, are on the margins of standard consciousness and sense of self yeah for sure uh, either by disposition constitution or because of these spontaneous occurrences and they often are uncomfortable at least initially with sort of the tried and true pathways that have been laid out they they have a sense of overwhelming inventio uh, that has to be properly responded to we can't just acquiesce in it because that will rabbit hole them in a lot of ways but we also can't just try to immediately assimilate them into existing things because it trespasses on what they are rightly regarding, something we've been putting our finger on repeatedly here, as something utterly unique to, that has happened to them.
Mm. Um, and so that, to my to my pedagogical mind, that is the tricky part of it. The other three need to be properly represented, and I have too often overrepresented the philosophical and the mental cultivation, and not given enough due regard to the devotional, which I'm trying to ameliorate right now in this conversation. But I also want to be properly responsive and responsible to the people who have these satori. That's I, I use the Zen term because there's no equivalent. You know, the the person who's sweeping, like these stories, a person who's sweeping in the garden and the stone hits the bench and then they're suddenly enlightened. And it's like, mm. what? I, obviously, lots of stuff is happening, but yeah. still there's something to that it, that's just overwhelming, right? Well, I know a yogi who, um, you know, she she can, you know, in, in a manner of seconds go into an extreme ecstatic state to yes. the point where they might pass out. <laughs> and that's not ordinary that kind of person doesn't belong in in, in an office <laughs> yes know? yes uh so 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 i i fully agree with with that there's there's a wildness to the sacred that we tend to to over domesticate when with the with the three ways we over domesticate what work or, or intellectual physical or devotion or you know mm. uh, psycho spiritual cultivation we domesticate it and we lose the wildness. And oh, I think the wildness the fourth, is important. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the fourth is, you know, it's my, my one of my favorite lines from C.S. Lewis Aslan, Aslan, is he a tame lion? Oh, he's not tame, but he's mm -hmm. good. Right. And, and, and that's like, that's Lewis crazy wisdom in our tradition. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Crazy yeah. wisdom. The fact that the numinous is terrifying in some aspects. Like the wildness, and I think the fourth is like they 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 duly represent the wildness of the numinous of mm -hmm. the sacred of the ultimately real. And crazy wisdom doesn't mean crazy. Uh, uh, That's it, right it, it, at all. That's exactly right. It's, it, but it's but it's it's not some. It's a, a way of being that is not uh, understandable, you know, uh, through our ordinary um, modes of understanding. It, and one of the things I got onto, and it took me over like a spirit when I was at the gospel seminar, was recovering the wildness of Jesus. Mm, nice. I, kept, I said the wildness, the strangeness. And what was I was really grateful for, happy, is everybody else took that up. They, they, they wanted to get back to, right? Like I was, I, 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 like I, I deeply criticized the reduction of parables to children's stories or allegories. A parable has to be wild, undomesticated, or, or like a koan, or you're not getting it. And if you domesticate the parable, and if Jesus is the parable of God, you're domesticating Jesus and you're losing something essential to what he was portraying. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking too much. I wanna hear what, what Chris has to say. Yeah, me too. I was waiting for to hear from Chris. Mm, yeah, so much. Um, I've swallowed a lot of things just because we've we've now moved past them. But one one thing that um, you know, one question that I often have, and it's a question I kind of hear in the offing here, is the relationship between the the relationship as domains of activity and study and experience between philosophy and and the sacred or philosophy and religious activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've never been able to under I've never been able to fully separate their relevance. Um I've never been able to fully separate them. It, it, it doesn't it, it doesn't doesn't seem natural or intuitive to me to regard them as different projects, but obviously they, they are different in some very significant ways, you know? And so I, one of the questions that I have right now is like, what are the, what is the sameness and difference between those domains and between those activities? And, um, and, you know, especially when we talk about the volatility and the sort of chaotic and mercurial nature of, the sacred and how we encounter it and how untamed and destructive it can be if it's not approached um 
perhaps if it's not approached with the right deportment. And then to me, that invites a question of what the role of philosophy is in helping to train that deportment. And, um, and I think in many ways, you know, you were, you were talking a little while ago about, you know, Jordan as an exemplary kind of philosophical, philosophically inquisitive mind and how there's a contrast in some ways between the philosophical inquiry that is explorative and probing and constantly casts into doubt, constantly calls into question. And the simplicity, and I mean that in a positive sense, the simplicity of falling in love with a way that is religious or that we would call religious. I find that word so difficult because, you know, let's say when I use the term religious, I really mean as related to the sacred or of the sacred. I think falling in love with a way is good. Falling in love with a way. But I think what happens in so many ways and what I remember hearing from Jordan and what that I've felt and seen in others is that falling in love with the ways, falling in love with the, ex falling in love with, well, in some ways it's falling in love with the experience of being loved. I think that's really what it is in Christianity is, it's falling in love with the experience of being loved. It's falling in love with a certain kind of agapic solicitude, right? It's what is meant by the idea of God being agape. And there is a, there is a process that often a person has to go through, canonically speaking, in order to even be prepared to encounter an experience like that and to be receptive to it such that it's possible at all, right? You can't just fall in love because something strikes you unawares. And that can happen. It can happen to certain people, I think, more than others. I think because certain people are disposed in such a way that they have a kind of receptivity or a natural openness, a natural vulnerability that allows them to be so struck and that allows them to unneurotically experience that kind of divine solicitude, that mysterious kind of love that has, that there is no accounting for, that simply accounts for itself as inherently meaningful and inherently virtuous. But I think not everyone has that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And I'm not speaking in a judgmental mm -hmm. sense, I'm also speaking reflexively, right? I know I don't always have it, and I know that a lot of people don't always have it because there is something mysterious and unjustified about it, right? Mm -hmm. We can think of all kinds of reasons to distrust it and all kinds of reasons to deny it, and it is the denial of that which is unaccountable in that agapic solicitude that is in the Christian canon, the deepest sin, right? It is the denial of your love. And that's really what it means to not be saved. It is simply to be in denial, in denial yeah. of some fundament of something that is so fundamentally real that its reality cannot be accounted for. Its reality cannot be accounted for. Its reality cannot be justified, right? Error and Sin, if I can use that term, can be justified given the decrepitudes inherent to our nature and that the fact that that seems to be in some ways the thing that is most natural to us. But there is something about that, the fullness of that solicitude that remakes people and in virtue of which people are remade, that is unaccountable. And therefore, it's also easy to deny Okay, so then, you know, if, if, if some people are disposed to fall in love with that experience such that they take it upon themselves and then mm -hmm. become vessels of it and for it and become that transitive property 
that confers it back out onto the world. They become carriers of it. That's what it means to become in the image of Christ, right? Is to carry forth that love and participate in it, but not participate in it as though you're feeding off of it. Participate in it insofar as you become it. You become, there is no distinction anymore between what you are and that in itself that now you are remade into. And that's what I say, the grace that we can sometimes behold when someone is struck by the way that they fall in love with and become that way that they fall in love with. That grace, I think, has something to do with that experience. Okay, so then if that is the religious experience, the experience that we don't rationalize our way into, that we don't infer our way into, that simply we, it strikes us and we fall in love with it and it remakes our way of being in the world. Then what then is this role of philosophy that is much more about the process of inquiring, the process of probing and trading propositions? Not just that, of course, but starts there, right? The process of ideation, the process of argumentation, the process of the dialectic. What does that do and what relationship does that have to the sensitization to being able to fall in love with something more real than you've ever known before? Oh, I lost your, uh, your, um, uh oh. Hear you. How about now, guys? Yeah, you're back. Yeah, you're back. Okay. Back. Sorry about that. I didn't realize that I was fading. I was cutting out. Um, so then the question is okay, well, then what is then the role of philosophy in relation to that project? Like they could easily be two completely different things belonging to two different categories of life, and never the twain shall meet. But of course, you know, John invoked Kierkegaard earlier in the relationship between Socrates and Jesus. I feel quite certain that there is a deep relationship between those things. So then what is the relationship? What is the relationship? What is the role of philosophy in the sensitizing the vulnerability? to falling in love with the sacred and therefore with that which is most real. And I think in many ways, and this is really how we teach the dialectic practice when we teach it, is it is a, it is a kind of existential decluttering when it is performed Socratically, right? That in some ways, I suspect that the role of, this is my proposal for it anyway, that I suspect that the role of philosophy, Socratically speaking, is to is to turn transparent those invisible beliefs that are actually circumscribing our sensitivity to those mysteries that exceed us, to get them out of the way, that it actually has a negative function, an ironic function, which is to disabuse ourselves of those systems of perception and conception, those paradigmatic beliefs, the pathologos, as Grimes called them, those sick beliefs that are actually standing between us and the capacity to be humbled before something mysterious in virtue of which we can be remade. So philosophy as being a kind of an existential decluttering of the psyche, but one that actually has to traverse all of the different forms of knowing and knowledge in order for that project to be possible. It has a propositional correlate. It has a procedural correlate to use John's typology. So I think that this is a really important question because too often I feel like these projects are considered to be separate things or they're just conflated as being one thing and both of them are somehow wrong to me. I think it's really important to understand how the philosophical disposition with all of its rigor and inquiry and discipline is trying to clean and organize and tidy and remove those obfuscating systems of patterns of behavior and belief that are actually closing us off to those things that have the capacity to conduct us into those aspects of reality that awaken us to the well, to ourselves. And anyway, I wanted, that was a little longer than I intended, but I no, wanted I, to- I want to take I, this question up. I want, I, to want to, up. I want to give that proposal to you. I want to see what you do with it because I want, both of you, um, because I want to understand that relationship better because I think that relationship is, it's going to be really important to the Silk Road because you're making a philosophical argument in service 
of sensitizing an encounter with the sacred. So clearly there must be a relationship between those things. And I want to understand how they function with one well, another. I, I, I've been thinking, of course, of course, in a convergent way, of course. I mean, there's the simpatico between us is pronounced. Um, so I think philosophy is not just the love of wisdom. It is that love of wisdom that affords us loving wisely. And falling in love with somebody is not sufficient for loving them wisely. It is necessary, but not sufficient. And what is it to love somebody wisely? I think there is the decluttering, the existential decluttering. But I think there is also, um, I think there is the cultivation of virtue and virtuosity with respect to the beloved. That, uh, that And that's what I mean by uh, loving wisdom allows you to love wisely. That's abstractly, a little bit more concretely. The work I've been doing, there's two current. So let me just mention both and then I'll turn it over to Andrew. <clears throat> I've been trying to show how profoundly at the heart of the rational is the imaginal and the ritual. I've been making argument after argument. To me, that is the religious argument. That is the religious movement to see that within your heart of the rational is the imaginal ritual, the ritual imaginal. But the reverse is also the case. There is also the rational within the imaginal. Now, it's not normally the rationality of, it's not exclusively or centrally the rationality of propositional coherence. It is the it is the avoiding, the overcoming of performative contradiction. And there is a normativity to ritual. Does it transfer broadly and deeply to many domains of your life? Does it transfer broadly and deeply many levels of the psyche? That is a normativity. That is a ratio. That is a ratio that is moving away from performative contradiction and pro trying to bring about the that those two things that make up anagogy, that inner justice and that deep connectedness to reality. And I think that is the rational within the imaginal. That's the philosophical so the imaginal within the rational is the religious. The rational within the imaginal is the philosophical. And when we do them both, we not only love wisdom, we love wisely. And each is irreducible to the other, but they are inseparably bound together. That was That is my sort of where my thinking is now in answer to cuz you're right you you are absolutely right this is a central question in, in 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 that is required to at least begin answering or at least questing upon if i'm going to be properly prepared if we are going to be properly prepared because you're going to join me on a lot of this journey for the pilgrimage of the philosophical silk road that's my initial and the person and this is the second the person that has really sung this to me. And I'm doing this course for Halkin Academy, uh, Ultimate Reality, God and Beyond. And we're doing Nishida. And we're doing it through Robert Carter, Canadian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, at his astonishingly great book, uh, The Nothingness Beyond God. And he talks about, because Nishida is a deep practitioner of Zen, but he never, ever for a moment gives up his profound commitment to being a philosopher. So Zen takes him into the imaginal ritual realization of no thingness but this neoplatonic exploration into intelligibility and by the way he, he even explicitly calls it that titles one book around that right gets him to basho you know the ultimate pure relationality that makes all intelligibility possible right and and the two are constantly singing to each other because the articulation of the basho prevents performative contradiction, overly simplistic reductions, uh, a, a failure of imagination for the religious experience. And the religious experience keeps driving the philosophical inquiry deeper and deeper and deeper. And so I think of him as the patron saint of Zen Neoplatonism, and he uses Neoplatonism. He's read, he's read the Neoplatonic philosophers. Of course, he's deeply, deeply internalized Heidegger, and given Filler's argument, Heidegger is the great attempt to return to Neoplatonism within Western philosophy. And that's why the Zen, that's the, the proposal of Zen Neoplatonism is an attempt to not just in words, but in exemplification, answer the question you have posed. It's about a performative resolution, not just a conceptual resolution. Yeah. 
Well, can, can I, yeah, I had a lot of thoughts actually about that when you were talking. Um, and forgive me for being too Buddhist here, giving a Buddhist answer. I don't think uh, you, that, I don't think that's a sin. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is if it's just, it, it is, it's a sin if I'm just repeating a bunch of Buddhist, you know, phrases that I've learned from. Okay. Book. Okay. Fair enough. If fair I'm enough. not really engaging, but, but, but I was thinking of the word view, like you cultivate a view. And they talk about view in Buddhism. So that so philosophy is about cultivating a view, I would say. Um, but also, I, I don't think it's just about decluttering. I think there's a playful aspect as well. So you declutter, but also you 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 discover, you know, in the, the tantric tradition, you, they talk about twilight language, the language of the Dakinis, which is, again, I think that's the imaginal area that John was, was exactly. there's pushing that into. There's yeah, a, there, so it's play. not just decluttering. Decluttering is sort of sutric early Buddhism, and then and then you move into the more uh, playful, you know, embodied aspects. Exactly. And and I was also thinking about, you know, you know, Buddhist Andrew, practice. One, eight, one, one quick point. Please. Those are interlocked. In order to have serious play, you have to safety frame. That's just play research. Absolutely. You have yeah. to do the decluttering Chris has talked about so you have the space and the framing in which the serious play can actually take on life. I just yeah, wanted to say that. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think you need to be more sutric when you become tantric in a way, because you have to be very, very careful when you're dealing with uh, more dangerous kinds of energies and things like that. I could give you just personal example of the practices you would do, right? So you would practice view the pre-preliminaries, you know, and, and then you would do 100,000 prostrations or something like that, right? Uh, so, 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 and then you would, then you would give up everything, like in, in a symbolic manner by making mandala offerings. Uh, and then you would, uh, you know, do, do a, a zillion, batrillion mantras, so that your mind and body are, are, are decluttered, so that you can go into that, 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 that's, that space. So, so I, I think that's built with, into the, in, into, into the, the traditional things, which, you know, are, are very, um, I think you need to go through a process. Um, but again, it's not a process of getting something, uh, uh, as, as you were saying, because it's, it, because it, it's, it's not, th that's just practice that that's not grace. That's practice. Um, hmm. you, you have to become the kind of person that can engage in certain kinds of cognitive and conceptual actions. This is the trans. This is part of the transformative truth proposal. Some truths are are only available, disclosable to us because we have to become the kind of people that can think the thoughts that are receptive to those truths. Uh, and, and that is, yeah, th that that is. I think that's that that is the part that the that religion, but also what you might call the religious side of philosophy is calling us to but i that's what I, you 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 again picked up i think very well i was trying to put together chris's proposal of the decluttering which i think of as the safety framing that they talk mm. about in play literature and the serious play the that wildness think, too that we've talked about yeah, before the wildness so how, the how do you get into the, the wildness religion... you don't start with wildness because then you just auto destruct right oh yeah 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 uh, yeah but you, but that that's it. So the, the the serious play is where the inventio of religion takes place, right? And and, and that's what I was trying to get at with the imaginal and the ritual is is imaginally augmented serious play that is powering transformative experience so that we can properly aspire to be the people that be, are receptive to the more deeper truths of ultimate reality. That's what ritual uh, is, and I think that is something that philosophy right is in service to, uh, but. Um, uh, but I think it's, it's also something that powers philosophy uh, because, uh, you know, and, and Plato knew this. Uh, he talks about that there's this thing going on beyond the argumentation and the conceptual. There's something in the drama and the presence of the personage of Socrates that seduces people into, uh, you know, into the philosophical life and carries them towards the good. Oh, it's there's like, sorry. Sorry, Andrew, just very, very quickly. I mean, one of the ways of thinking about this that connects both, again, connects the philosophical to the sacred a little bit more clearly is that the, the idea that you have to be sort of brought to exhaustion, 
Mm -hmm. um, you have to be brought to exhaustion of your worldview. You have to be brought to exhaustion of your capacity, brought to exhaustion of the thoughts you think and the ideas you have and the words you use, right? That somehow all of that needs the, 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 the I mean, John, you've been describing the, the process of purgation uh, in advance of the Silk Road. And I think that either we think of this philosophically or we think of it religiously, but in either case, there is a purgation. There's a purgation of that which you have at your disposal and the drying out of what you have at your disposal. And I think that, you know, what is it that calls a person to the necessity of having to change, to the necessity of having to wander somewhere that we've never wandered before? And I think it's it's in some sense... If we're not predisposed to desire such things. It's the exhaustion of where we are in situ that uh, I think provokes the appetite. Um, and I think that's where the Socratic project and the overtly religious project speak to one another more profoundly. I, I, I think there's a way in which, just to go back to some of the Cogsai literature, you have to sort of exhaust the work frame in order to do the reversal, mm. the metanoia into the play frame. Right. And so also, so you don't try to reduce, you don't get the modal confusion that Fromm worried about. You don't try to reduce or logically identify them. And you properly see that, that both are needed and they're in proper relationship to each other. Yeah. And Gurdjieff's work, he, his first books were designed to kind of uh, written to be to be written to the unconscious, to try to undermine our mechanical thought patterns in, in every possible way before you would go into the his second series of book was books was like how to bring christian mysticism in contact with 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 you know the east and west and how to find an actual path that was the meetings with remarkable men you know and then the third one was sort of the more secret one which is ineffable not easily um des describable so 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 i think that exhaustion process is, is 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 fundamental you know the exhaustion of samsara uh in 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 the uh in the practices i think you would exhaust yourself philosophically you exhaust yourself you know in mm -hmm. in, in your your physical um knots in your body um and then and then the, the emotionality and, and all of that has to, is just it's just a it's a process of 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 yeah exhaustion so that a new kind of energy can arise uh in, inside of you which is which is more distilled or it's very you know alchemical yeah but think about let's you let's play with uh -huh, let's play with uh, the the analogy i mean you can physically exhaust yourself by just leaping around chaotically yeah. um right or there's the kind of dexterous flowing right uh exhaustion that comes through extended martial art practice in which you realize that just flailing about won't actually bring flexibility and opening to many parts of your body mind it just you need that you need the detailed dexterity to get into the minute fascia of mm -hmm. opening and, and and that is what something like this you know a, a deep neoplatonic endeavor uh, mm -hmm. properly does. 